Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon, WCWP 88.1 FM, Brookville, New York, tcbradio.com, wcwp.org, and in some places, tcbradio.podbean.com. So, we have an incredible show today. This, this is one of those shows that's actually quite personal. Uh, this is the story. Uh, we have an incredible author here. His name is David Grohn, and he wrote a, the, the story of heroism, courage, uh, grace, uh, hope, and survival. It's the story of his parents, and I have here with me Paul Solomon, my brother and fellow attorney. Good morning, everyone. And uh, we actually had the honor and the rare, rare privilege to have met both uh, Rabbi and Mrs. Grohn in Holland uh, I think it was in the 90s. Mid-90s. Yeah. A- and hung out with them in Zandvoort in Holland and, you know, got to hang out with, at the Herring Stand and have Dutch coffee and all these other cool things. So we took the train <laughs> to Harlem and, and then we transferred. transferred. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't the four, five, or six. <laughs> right. So, you know, we it, it was just an incredible story. So we have David Grohn. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank nice you, to be here. Thank you for, uh, first of all, thank you for your contribution to Jewish history. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, for, My you pleasure. Know, this, this book must be so many important things all at once. It, it has to be a story of inspiration. It has to be a story of courage, um, uh, of the the testing of human limits, uh, and survival right. uh, at all at once. Uh, the name of the book? The name of the book is Jew Face. Now, that's not, that's not your typical name. Usually it's gone with the wind or how to win or, you know, right. making money in the stock market without really trying. Uh, yeah, and it had um, a little bit of resistance in some places, I, I have to say. Um, most people found the, bo- the title quite catchy. Uh, they felt that it grabbed them, and they felt that the controversial sound to it would be appealing. And um, there were a few people, though, had had some problems with the book, with the title. I, um, there are explanations to the title, though, and that's the very important fact. The you met my parents as you remember as you, and, a few years back. Very touching. In fact, your father said to me that if I were to ever get married, he wanted to be the rabbi to perform the ceremony. Oh, very nice. Yeah, and he meant that. Yeah. Yes, you know. So, um, the the background of my parents was was quite interesting in Holland before the war. There, the Ashkenazi community and the Sephardi community were. They got along well, but they were very distinctly different. As they are today. As they are today, yes, exactly. Um, In some ways, they blended in maybe better than they do today in some places, but they certainly, there certainly was a distinction. My father came from an Orthodox background and a totally Ashkenazi background. My mother came from a Sephardic background and not very religious. Yet, in Holland, the look of a Jew was what the look of, was the look that my mother had. Amsterdam was very Jewish. Amsterdam was about 10% Jewish, and even a lot of the lexicon in, in, in Amsterdam was, 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 was Jewish. They, the, the term punim, which is Yiddish for face, was, was so common and uh, that, that people who weren't even Jewish would use that term. Uh, it was just it was that kind of city before the war. And in Holland which is now a very mixed group of people with a lot of people from a lot of different places. Back then, if you were dark complexion and even a little bit of a dark complexion and you had a, and, a, and your hairstyle was a little, was a little bit dark, you are considered to be a, a, the look of a Jew. And my mother had that look. My mother had the dark, the dark, the, the dark hair, the dark skin, and she looked, by Dutch standards, completely Jewish. And in Holland, it was not a bad thing to, to say, to say, oh, look at that Yodakop, which was a nice, it wasn't, it wasn't a negative term. Uh, Yodakop meaning really the, the, the head of a Jew, the Jew, but it was a Jewish face is what they were referring to. That was part of the reason behind the title. The other reason behind the title was an incident that took place and now, I mean, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit to give a little bit of a background of some of the, the horror involved in the story, because this is, does happen in Nazi-occupied Holland, and I'll get into more stuff in a little bit. But there was a certain time where my mother, when she had to be moving, had to move from place to place, found herself working in a, on, a bar, on a barge that, that was 
stayed in port. It didn't travel. And but she was on the water and she would sleep on she was sleep in a special part of the barge. It wasn't a very comfortable situation, but at least her life wasn't in immediate danger. At the, uh, she basically was there to help the family and have to put up with, in this particular case, the, the rantings of a man who didn't really particularly love the Jews, but because of his background and his ethics, wasn't going to turn one over for death. But at one point, she was standing on that boat, and I'll, re- I'll read it basically. I'm going to read this to you because this really explains the it, explains It's a one-hour show. That's right? why we yeah. have an expanded exactly. <laughs> format. It's uh, the first part. The first thing that I'm reading from the book uh, for two years really basically about the title. One day about two weeks later, it was damp and miserable on Bookman's boat. With the rain falling slightly, the air was cold and unpleasant. Sapora was working on the deck when in the distance she saw a boat heading up the river. As the boat passed them, she saw two Nazi officers on board, one with a pair of binoculars in his hands. She could see the binoculars were pointed at her, Turning away at this point would do nothing but invite a search of Bookman's boat, so she just looked back. She was frightened, but at least if she looked, she would know what was going on. She could not see the face of the German officer as he could see hers, but she saw as his lips moved and he uttered the words that sent a shiver down her spine. Judenkopf, he was saying. That woman is a Judenkopf. She has the face of a Jew. I can see that Jew face from here. Sapora would tell Nardis later in the day, and before nightfall, she would be gone. It was no longer safe to remain there. Wow. Basically, um, there were two elements of the title, and that's why I bring that up. The first element was the fact that it was a very common thing within Amsterdam. It wasn't a bad aspect at all. But from a German perspective, anybody who had the face of a Jew was a target. And it's a very important part of the story because it basically means that my mother from the beginning from 1940, the May of 1940 to May of 1945, was a target constantly. And a lot of this story, so much of the story, happens because of the way my parents looked. My father didn't look Jewish. He was raised Orthodox. He, he Rabbi Grown. became a rabbi. <laughs> yes. Rabbi Grown did not look Jewish. Did not look Jewish. <laughs> I actually always what, said... How would you describe to our listening audience what he looked like? Also, what are your parents' names? So this way they would... Yeah, my, my mother's name is Sephora. And her maiden name was Rodriguez Lopez, which is the Spanish Portuguese descent, primarily Portuguese. This Lopez Rodriguez Lopez with S at the end, which is Portuguese as opposed to Lo- wow. Rodriguez Lopez with Z at the end, which would be Spanish. Wow. And my father, Nardis Grown, uh, who later, I, like you said, became became a rabbi. Um, he in his in his early years. Um, you know, he was always a good-looking man. He had you know, very blue eyes. He had a reddish. He had reddish hair, light complexion. Uh, later in his life, uh, he looked like Pope John Paul II, and, and as he really did. And he <laughs> and he actually, when he he even agreed with it to the point later on, he actually embraced the comparison. Did he like ever pitch the the God Squad idea? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, nothing like that. <laughs> But he did. He, but he did like. He actually he grew to like the comparison. So um, that's the begin. That's a little bit of a start about the book. So let's 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 talk a little about their lives first. How how old were your parents roughly in 1940? Okay, um, my mother was my mother was 18. My father was 20. Okay. Now, wh- how did how did their f- families come to Amsterdam? You know, what, how many generations back were they? Is Nardis a Dutch name? Uh, let's talk just some basic nuts and bolts here. Absolutely. The story needs a, a beginning because it's just fascinating at every step of the way. Absolutely. Um, my father's family, uh, from the, his mother's side, was so Dutch that my, mother's, my father's mother's maiden name was Zeelander. There is a province in Holland called Zeeland. Oh, so that's where they were from. Yes. My father's side, from his, from my father's father's side, uh, was very European. Goes back through Germany and originally originates in Czechoslovakia, then Czechoslovakia. My mother's side is a little different. My mother's side was the Spanish Portuguese. Obviously, the Jews that got kicked out of Spain and Portugal went through Portugal. Like I said, primarily Portuguese. But my mother wasn't entirely Sephardic. On her mother's side, she was she was Ashkenazi. 
But as I don't know which if the viewers here know, I'll, I'll explain something because I do a lot of explaining in the book for because I don't ever take for granted that people know things. And even Jewish people know yeah, exactly, the differences yes. because you know we're Greek Jews and people are like they're, they're you know. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's that? I, I want to get I want to get into something that I have in the book specifically for the benefit of the Greek Jews. Something that I wrote in there. Um, the I, I've always believed that when you're you're explaining something that is educational, it's better off just to assume that people don't know, because then you don't insult anybody. You just assume that it just 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 blanketly explain it, and then you don't worry about who does know and who doesn't know. Um, traditionally. In, in even in the Orthodox communities, a uh, person is the Jewish person is a Jewish person based on what their mother is. But whether or not they hold to the Sephardic or Ashkenazi customs, it's usually based on what the father is. Okay. Now there are times when know that. there are times when it's not like that because let's say there's not a dominant force. There's one dominant force more than the other, so maybe they would take that that tradition on. But primarily, they do take on the the traditions of the father. Oh, so that means I have to call my wife after the show. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a mixed marriage. She's Ashkenazi and we're... Well, that's what my father used to say <laughs> about, my, about him, him and my mother. They, they used to joke about it being a mixed marriage. Well, what's interesting, not to deviate, but let me ask this. In the, we're, we're Greek Jews and we're members of the Greek Jewish Synagogue uh, of New York and the Lower East Side at 280 Broom Street. And there are stories that, we're, that our museum um, director tells us that in Greece there were both Sephardic synagogues next to Romanyot synagogues. Romanyot meaning Jews of the Roman Empire, um, and Sephardic meaning you know from Spain. Right. Because in Greece there were Spanish-speaking Jews. They spoke Ladino. And when World War II came around, the Nazis were able to pick people out by Jewish voice. So if you were a person, you spoke Spanish, mm-hmm. you know, Ladino in Greece, they automatically knew that you were a Sephardic Jew. Right. So what made them vulnerable? in the first round of roundups was what they spoke. Your mom had the problem, at least you know you could always shut up. Your mother had couldn't you know, how do you hide your face? I right. Mean, that's who you are, that's your window to the outside. Which yes, absolutely. There was right. no hiding it. Right. No did, hiding did it. Did your mom know Ladino by any chance? No, she did not. All right, but no. did she know Portuguese? No, she did not, because it was it goes back generations and generations. But she was very proud and still is very proud of that background. So she, what languages did she speak? Well, be- At this time in 1940, I'm talking. Well, because of the fact that the educational system in Holland and in Europe in general, but the educational system has always been good. I think my, my mother, I believe, grew up um, knowing some French, knowing some German, knowing some English. Um, nothing, I, I don't know that any of that would became, became actually any type, with any type of fluency, but there was, you know, she, she had a good education. Did any of that education enhance her survival capabilities? No. That didn't impact that at all. Uh, maybe, um, I think there might have been a couple times here and there that the English might have, but I don't know. I, don't, I would say that really wasn't the big factor, factor in that. Just, go, let me just, just going back real quickly to the beginning of what you said about the, the, how they, where they were in the beginning of the war, my mother was born and raised in Amsterdam, with the exception of um, one time for three years where she lived in a town called Bussum which I don't even mention in the book because it really isn't significant. It's just one time where she lived in a suburb of, well, it's almost like a suburb of Amsterdam, not far. My father, however, was born in Rotterdam. And at the age of six, my, his whole family, when my father was six, the entire family moved from Rotterdam to Amsterdam because my father's father had a printing shop that could not make it in business because he would not stay open on the Jewish Sabbath, on Shabbos. So that was a background. That was the kind of background that my father's family came from. My mother lost her mother at the age of 13. My mother's mother passed away at 13. And um, it changed a lot. We, we still have conversations about this. It changed things from the very beginning. It impacted. It has to impact somebody. Um, she, she had one brother, a younger brother. My father had a younger sister, and he had two older brothers and an older sister. So uh, the families were very different. In some ways, it was interestingly enough, there were some connections here and there where actually there were some interactions between family members that they only identified later. Like my father did, some, did something work once f- with my mother's cousin and didn't even know this or my mother's cousin's father. So things, things did get, um, there were, because it was a small community, relatively speaking, Holland only had 140,000 Jews before the war. 
So uh, the chances are there would be some connection. My father, for example, in his uh, time, in, in, because he was so active in the Jewish community, would actually go to the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue with his friends. The Spanish, it's the, called the, in Dutch, it's called the Esnocha, which is the very, it still exists. We've been there. Yes. That's the museum that we went to. Right. Yes. 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 Uh, you are listening to Taking Care of Business on WCWP, 88.1 FM, Brookville, New York. You are listening to Richard Solomon, Paul Solomon, and David Groen. We're talking about the book Jew Face by David Groen, G-R-O-E-N. He is the author. Uh, this is a, a tremendous story about his parents' survival during the uh, Nazi occupation of Holland during World War II. Uh, you may also be catching this uh, show on podcast, and you can catch us at tcbradio.com. And to catch more uh, information about uh, Jew Face by David Groen, check out his website, which is hollandsheroes.com. And, of course, his book is available on, on Amazon. But if you go to his main website, you'll see a lot of material about the book, hopefully this podcast, and a lot of other interviews and things like that. My brother Paul is going to say something. Now, uh, at the time of your, the trouble beginning in May 1940, were your parents married, engaged? What, what was their relationship at that time? They didn't know each other. Okay. Which is a, I, I love that question because it really does give a little bit of a background aspect to the whole story. Um, my mother uh, was engaged. My mother was engaged to to um, someone who was a, at that point a sweetheart for a couple of years. Somebody who was very similar, much more similar to her um, religious background. Um, the lifestyle that she lived was much more similar. And um, my father was in, in, the, in the Jewish community, in the much more Orthodox Jewish community, but he did take um, upon himself to join the National Guard in Holland, something similar to the National Guard in Holland, because he always had a sense of what was brewing in Europe. But they, always, didn't, know, they didn't know each other. It's always good to have a gun <laughs> and, and to learn how to use one just in case. Yeah, and that made him actually, that actually was very rare for somebody in that community. But no, they didn't know each other. My mother, um, at the time, uh, you know, I, my mother is 90 years old and, and still incredibly, she's, thank God, she's very well, she's, she's healthy, she's, she's uh, sharp, she's, she's active, she's, she's, we, we've talked, we talked about it recently, we talk a lot about the book, and talk, so we spoke recently about how, you know, the life that she lived before the war, uh, was really going the direction of a normal, straight kind of a, a life without any hassle. You know, she, you know, she, and she, it was really quite remarkable, especially considering the fact that she had a difficult life as a child, losing her mother at thirteen, and then that the impact that that has had on her father. But um, when the Nazis invaded Amsterdam, everything changed. We were, we were in the square. There, there's a, I forgot where it is, but in Amsterdam, there's a square where all the Jews were like, sort of centralized for the roundup. We were actually there. We actually, in fact, I remember the Portuguese synagogue is like on a place called like Judenstadt, mm -hmm. which is like Jewish street or something like that. Was it Leitza Plain, maybe? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. No, but I'll never forget when Rabbi Groen, we were in his house, and he was telling us when the war came, how Holland was only in the war for like 20 hours. Literally, the Nazis came and just... There was no resistance at that moment. And he said, you cannot understand how in 20 hours the world changed. That always resonated with me. And he said, look around. You'll see no monuments, no nothing to that a Jew lived here once. And that resonated to me because throughout the rest of our trip, I kept an eye open. And other than in the um, museum and maybe one tiny area that he pointed out, there was nothing. There was no World War II memorial. There was absolutely nothing. I don't remember even seeing mezuzahs on doors. The thing about Holland was, uh, and this is one of the reasons why this book is important. Uh, from a personal perspective, it's obvious to everybody why it's important. I mean, obviously, now everybody in, the fa in my family and my friends and everybody close to us has the background. But there's, a, there's another element of this which is so, so important. A lot of people don't know what happened in Holland. A lot of people don't even know that Holland and the Netherlands are the same country. <laughs> I mean, I actually, I actually say that in the beginning of the book, that there's people who really don't even understand that. Um, people, you know, there's some, there is some, obviously some ignorance about this country. 
what they what even people who aren't necessarily ignorant don't realize is that very few, maybe there was, I don't think there was a country in Europe from a percentage standpoint other than maybe Poland which was devastated not just from a percentage standpoint but from a number standpoint a country that was so devastated in in, in its loss in the war 140,000 Jews and left over with just a little bit more than 30,000 Jews Greece was like that Greece had about 100,000 Jews and I think 3,000 survived yeah you know I think what it is is that Poland had the highest numerical loss and then I think uh, countries like Greece had like a 97% you know murder rate because that was, it was a murder. in Greece was basically destroyed. There was no Jewish community in Greece after the war. Right. And most of the Jews of Greece were Sephardic Jews from Salonika. And that's where most of the Sephardic you know, Jews were at the time. It was actually known as the Jerusalem of the Mediterranean. So, yeah, they had, but, but, but most people also don't know the story of, the, you know, that there even were Greek Jews let alone that there was a Holocaust that basically wiped out the Greek Jewish population. Right, right. Yeah. And, and uh, there's something that's very important. And one of the, the top priority that I had in this book that wasn't personal was to capture the devastation of Europe as a whole. And, and when you do that, you really have to really primarily make sure people understand about Russia and Poland and Hungary, and, the, and that's where the numbers were so, in, so enormous. I mean, the, the large numbers of people that were, that were murdered, and you talk, have to talk about, you have to speak about Auschwitz, and you have to speak about the death camps, and you have to address it. It was a top priority for me. Uh, but when you talk about a country like Greece, and you talk about a country like Holland, people don't know. And you you kind of understand it. You kind of understand that um, you have to. Everybody desensitizes themselves to some extent. Everybody who is has a human element to them understands the pain and the suffering of losing six million of your people. So, relatively speaking, you're not going to necessarily focus on the loss of one hundred and four thousand people. But when 104,000 people is 75% of the community, then you're talking about a story that people need to hear. Everybody knows Anne Frank. Everybody knows the story about Anne Frank. And, and it's a, it's a, obviously, it's a very moving story. I just want to address that real something about the story of Anne Frank. In, in discussions, there were, like I said, there was some resistance about the title. And there were some people who suggested that I make the title The Anne Frank That Lived. I know where that probably came from because... I was in the living room when your mother told me that she was like the Anne Frank that lived. <laughs> no, actually, it did not come from. It did no, not come from. I remember when we were there, and your yeah. mother was serving us the coffee and what was that pastry? That butter you cookies. Uh, yeah, butter yeah. cookie. Yeah. She said, "I'm the Anne Frank who lived." No, yes. But, no. No. She she looked us straight in the eye and said that. But no. But my mother. My mother. I'm call her. <laughs> 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 but well, she she recognized. She definitely her story has that element, and she definitely recognizes that element. But my mother was. 100% in agreement with me that to speak of that element, no matter where you speak of it, to speak of that element is fine. But to exploit it in the title is wrong. That's how, that to me, that's, that's how I felt it would be. To explain to people so they can relate to it, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of similarities in the story. And, but, a, lot of, and a lot of very important differences. And that's the key difference is the ending. The best difference. That, yes. I mean, this sat, I mean, one's, the reality is, and this is something I want to mention about the book. It brings me to the to a point about the book. But first, let me just say that I I was I was totally against using that as a title because I felt it was exploiting the the tragedy of Anne Frank. And uh, but the one thing about this book that is so critical for people to know that as much as the subject matter is so sensitive and so delicate and so painful in so many spots there is an element of this book that makes you feel good because the reality it, is it, i'm still i'm still here, here on the radio yes exactly <laughs> there there was from a perspective of a personal family situation there was a there was a happy ending element how many brothers and sisters do you have i am the youngest of five i have three older brothers and an older sister and all of them are here because because yes because your family survived that's correct and but, that's yeah 
but back in May of 1940, your mother's engaged to somebody else. Your father doesn't know your mother. So how did this all happen? I mean, you know. It's I'm a great intrigued. question because you shouldn't be here right now. <laughs> exactly. It's May of 1940. The Nazis have invaded. Your parents don't know each other. And other from the subcaption, I know a story of love and heroism in Nazi-occupied Holland. But I mean, I'm dying to know a little bit more. Absolutely. Uh, my... Unfortunately, and this is, it's, in the book, and this, is, this is answering your question, there's a reason I'm answering this. I, at the end of every section where a personal story is talking about somebody who, who passed away, I'm not sure say passed they away, mur- killed, they were murdered, they were murdered. I always, you know, I yes. always correct myself on that, because I even put it in the book. I put the name, I put murdered, I put the date, and I put where. So, for example, my mother's father Marcelo Rodriguez murdered September 23rd, 1943 in Auschwitz. The only non-family member to get that spot in this book is the man that my mother was engaged to. Because he was important to her, and he was an important part of the story. He was taken away in, in, the big, in probably the biggest raid that took place in Amsterdam, and he was taken to, he was taken to Auschwitz, and he was, he was murdered as well. My mother when the communities were being shaken up and, and, and people were being taken out of their home and, and either sent to, to Auschwitz or to Westerbork, which was the Dutch concentration camp set up, my mother w- was studying to be a nurse, moved into the hospital where she, would, where she was studying, to, where she was going to be the nurse. My father, who at the, by the time this was all taking place, had already had his false passport as a as a not with a with a with a non Jewish name, and lived as a non Jew, would go to this hospital, and play ping pong, table tennis, because he enjoyed it, and it was a little bit of a diversion. And my mother, a nurse there, caught his eye. And little by little. At this time, with things that, that, as they were, where just having any kind of friend made a difference, my father and my mother got to know each other a little bit better, more and more, and my father took to my mother immediately. I mean, I'm going to say this right now. This is my mother, but if you take a look at the cover of, of the book, you'll understand. Hollandsheroes.com has a picture yes. for yeah, this. Yeah, you'll understand. My, mother, yeah, the, my father took to my mother, looked to my mother right away, fell in love with my mother, didn't really, she really wasn't interested. And on any romantic level in the beginning, because there's a war going on, <laughs> yeah. and she had just lost her fiance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to my, to, this is just, but this was a friend. Right, there's a war going on, and uh, I'm busy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do a quick station ID. You are listening to Taking Care of Business, hosted by Richard Solomon, co-hosted by Paul Solomon, and our special guest is David Grohn, the author of Jew Face. Uh, you can catch his website, HollandsHeroes.com. And uh, you can check us out at WCWP, WCWP 88.1 FM, Brookville, New York, WCWP.org. Our our radio shows are now podcasted on the WCWP.org website. Uh, There's a special place where the talk shows are archived. You can check that out here. I'm sure this uh, podcast will be on hollandsheroes.com. And you can look for the book in a number of different places, including Amazon.com. Uh, to me, just a quick editorial here, having met the, the, the people behind the book personally, uh, this is one of those stories you must read because I, I remember when your dad um, had us in the living room with your mom, and he told us from his heart the story of their survival, what they did, their courage. I'm not going to give anything away from the book. I was just, it was probably one of the most moving days of my life to this day. Yeah. Now, the audience may not realize this, but in essence, your father was part of the Dutch resistance, correct? Yes, he was. Okay. So did your mother at this time in the hospital while they're playing ping pong have any clue that he was part of the resistance? And how did he break it to her that he was a Jew? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think that from the very beginning... Because of my mother's situation, there was no reason for my father to ever hide it. No, but it's not a question of hiding so much as she knew. What, she just knew from the beginning. I don't need. I did, we actually never. It's a good question, but I, I think she just knew from the very beginning that he was Jewish. Is grown a Jewish name? In Holland, it was at the time. It's not. It's. Um, and by the way, you asked earlier about Nardis. Nardis was a derivative of Bernardus, which was obviously like a Dutch Bernard type of thing. 
Um, groen is Dutch for, it's it pronounced in Dutch, it's pronounced groen, which is Dutch for green. And it was very common that there are a lot of Jewish names that were either green or extensions of that, of green. So it was, yeah, it was a pretty common Jewish name. My mother's, ma my mother's name was very Jewish in Holland. Rodriguez Lopez in Amsterdam at that time, if you heard that name, you knew she was Jewish. So everything, yeah, so it was pretty common. They were there, there was no question about them being Jewish. My, this is the thing. My mother, from the very beginning, um, the element of bravery that took place between my mother and my father, and this is a very important element of the story, there were two different, it was two different types of courage and bravery that, bravery that were exhibited. And it's, it, 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 it kind of also lends to the, to the story and to the question that you were asking here. My father, because he was in the Dutch resistance, being in the Dutch resistance didn't mean that every single minute of every single day, you, you know, that, you was a, that anybody was aware of what you were doing. You were walking around as a Dutchman, and you had to be, you had to be smart about his activities and careful about his activities, but he would do things that would help people find, either people who needed to be, find a place to, to hide or any type of different activities that had to take place. But he had moments where he could live without a certain degree of fear. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't always, he didn't always have to be careful. It didn't mean he wasn't always aware. He didn't trust anybody at all, which actually impacted, in some ways, impacted his life later, how he approached things in some ways. But he was very, he had to be very cautious, and very careful, and he was in danger a lot because of the activities. But he could walk in an environment and not necessarily have to have the fear that just based on looking at him that he was going to be in danger. My mother could, there was nowhere she could go. And, and I'm going to say, that, and, and, this, and, and she had to live in a constant fear from the beginning to, to the end of the war. There was never a question. The pivotal, one of the pivotal moments in their life together happens to be the prologue of the book, and I'll share it. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to tell the story. Um, but it's in, the, it's in the website as well. I'm very open about the prologue. I'm very proud of the prologue because it really says this, tells the story so much about what really took place between the two of them. My mother got to the, it was the final most, most devastating raid in the hospital where my mother was working, and she was on the third floor of the nurses' quarters. And my father was in the hospital. They didn't know, again, nobody knew that he, you know, he was just maybe a Dutchman who was going to help drive a bus or help transport people. They were going to move them to different places. He wasn't, he never, he managed to find the delicate balance. He never did anything to portray collaboration with them, but he, ne but he was just a regular Dutch guy. So he put himself in the right spots. And he looked for my mother. He found her on the third floor. And my mother had become so... Look, she's a normal human being. After going through all this, you're seeing that you're knowing that you're there's a good chance you're never going to see your loved ones again. Your, her father, her father had been taken, had, had left Amsterdam. Her brother had left Amsterdam. They were never going to come back. All her friends, so many of her friends, so many of her family. She's working in the hospital. She knows she looks Jewish. She knows she can't run. She knows she can't hide. She's on the third floor, and she says, "You know what? I'm done." I'm just going to go with these people wherever they take them. I'm a nurse. I can help them. I'm going to make sure they're going to be okay, and I'm just going to go with them. My father looked at her and basically said to her in these words, he said, if that's the case, I'm throwing you out the window now because they're going to kill you anyway, and I'm going to kill you quickly. They're going to hurt you and torture you first. God knows what they're going to do to you. He said, if that's the case, if you want to die, you're going to die quickly. I'm not going to let them kill you slowly. Well, it was very pivotal. My mother basically at that point knew that my father was right. As hard as it was and as difficult as it was, uh, incredible amounts of courage that my mother had to show at that moment right there as well, she followed my father and it was the beginning of a journey that took her from place to place with the guidance of my father. Let's talk about that. How did they survive the war? How do you survive the war with having a Jew face in constant occupation where anybody that you could potentially trust is being hauled off and murdered. Okay. How do you how do you find any hope and how do you live day to day and what do you survive on? Okay, good question. Um, in in the case of my my mother uh, at this point in time 
when my father said this to my mother, my mother and my father really, uh, no, nothing really happened with my mother without my father being involved. But it wasn't only my father that was involved. My father at this point had become connected in the underground as we have spoken of the resistance and took her from place to place. There's a story, you know, when they left, when they left Amsterdam, um, it's one of the most exciting and I have to use the word exciting because it really is. It's I mean, it's an incredible story of what took place on a train. My um, my father had commandeered, as I don't guess, that's the way I like to put it, a uniform of um, of an officer that worked with the Nazis. Not so a Nazi a, officer, not a, a Dutchman, a, a, a occupied, basically an some occupied. Some type of policeman, some type okay. of yeah. As a policeman, sort of, sort of uniform and a gun. Okay, although that's handy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, under Nazi permission, in other words, someone who would be operating under Nazi permission. Yeah, somebody who the Nazis would assume would be doing their bidding. Okay, is the best way to put it. Okay, that's fair. Okay. And he and he took my mother on the train, and they and he basically instructed my mother how this had to take place, and they had they sat on a on a train, filled with Nazi officers. <laughs> And these Nazi officers take a look at this this beautiful, young, obviously Jewish woman and basically want to come over to my father and, and say, instead of says to my father, what are you doing with this woman? And if you want to know what happens, you're going to have to buy the book. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but they obviously got through the train. Now, when they got to um, to the place where where they were going. Um, where were they going? They were going, they were going to... Um, Swala, I believe it was. The place is called Swala. I think that's that's the frame. How of the far is that from Amsterdam? In terms of hours or minutes or I'm gonna say an hour and a half. I okay. think it was it was a trip. It was definitely a journey. It was um going north. And um And why were they going there as opposed to any other place? My father had heard that there was a place there that would uh, give some safety to him and my mother. More so, more so to, to my mother because he knew that he could actually move around, but he needed to find a place, place, places for her or a place for her where she could have some type of permanence because that was the only way she was going to survive. Uh, it, it began the journey that when they arrived in Swala from, from there, from one place to another place to another place, where they en- eventually ended up in the, house, in the home of the Takiftas. That's um, it's, it's a Dutch name. It's two words in Holland. It's T E is the first part of the name, K I E F T E is the second part of the name. When I said earlier that the top priority that I had from a non personal standpoint was to speak of the horrors of what took place in Europe, the second priority in the book was personal and very important was to make sure that everybody understood the greatness of the Takiftas. I'll get back to that in a minute, but. What ended up basically happening was from one contact to another contact in the resistance, eventually my father came across people who were connected and related to Tikiftas. And after staying in different places, my mother eventually ended up in that home where she would be able to hide in, hide in plain sight, so to speak, for, for almost a year and a half. Wow. What did they do to to live on for money and you know like you know I mean it, it costs money to live and you still need to do basic things like wash your clothes and you know go to the market and get food how did how did they do any of this stuff It wasn't so much a uh, pursuit of money it was a pursuit of an environment that provided those services uh, so could, the, you, could you be more elaborate? Sure, yeah. sure. Well, uh, for example, I talked when I read about the story about when my mother was on that barge. Um, she worked. Uh, she was able. There was an opportunity for her to wash herself. There was an opportunity for her to get food, and for a bed to sleep on. It wasn't. It wasn't wonderful. It had its. It had its price to pay. There was a price to pay for it. Um, but it made her. It was a. She was able to survive when my father. Um, at the time that this happened, that specific moment, my father was working in, um, there was a reclamation project. To It was called the Polder, where they were basically, the best way to describe it was they were trying to take the land up and turn what was water into land. 
Like dredging, sort of? I guess, sort of like dredging. I guess you could call it like dredging. Well, that's a common thing even to this day in the Netherlands. Right, right. That's their very, and that's, and they began, it always, they always needed to because Netherlands actually means lowlands. Nederland is lowland. And it was, um, at, it was something they had to do, and the Germans conducted the project, and they let Dutch people work. They let Dutch, only Dutch, strong, young Dutch men work there. But when the projects were over, the Dutch, those Dutch men were either going to be shipped to Germany or God knows what they were going to do. So how, how, long, how long was your family basically in hiding and, and working in sort of plain sight? Uh, my father was never actually in hiding. Uh, he, the only, I guess you could say, he did spend time at the Takiftas because there was a certain degree of permanency to that, um, visiting my mother at every opportunity. I'll get into that. I'm going to explain something about that part that's a very important aspect of the story, very important aspect. Uh, but my mother, from the time, I mean, if you count, the, you can count the time in the hospital, theoretically, but really, no. I mean, when the time, um, August 13th, 1943, was, the, was that big raid in the hospital, pretty much from that point on till the end of the war in May of 1945, my mother was not, there's no, there was no freedom. My mother was, it was constantly, constantly hiding. It was, it was so much so that when the war ended, she needed to be, she needed to leave the Takifta, even though she could have stayed there and lived comfortably there, she needed to leave just because she needed to... to she needed air. She needed air. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it was difficult. She put herself in a difficult in difficult life for, for a short while after that because of that, but she had to. My father, um, the story really, you know, with it, it, when it evolves, it evolves into two things. It evolves into my, my mother's extraordinary life primarily the life in the Takiftas, but leading up to that and the different places she had to go. And the other part of the story is my father's, I, I mean, I don't want to use the word escapades, but there's certain aspects, certain things that he, that he experienced and certain, and sometimes exciting one or two, one story is even funny. Let's hear it. Okay. Let's hear it. That sounds like a lead-in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I kind of hoped you'd ask me to say it. Um, no, the, the story that what my father needed at one point after he had to he had to find he had to find places to stay so even if he didn't necessarily although he wasn't necessarily on the run if he was just roaming around aimlessly he would be picked up and at best shipped to germany and at worst killed because he's, he'd be useless i mean he's in, in, in there in the germans eyes if you were in german and you were useless it didn't matter even it didn't matter you didn't even have to be jewish if they didn't find you useful for you then then kill there was no respect for human life that's a common that's a commonly known um, but my father, at one point, he went to this home. He knocks on the door. They ask him what he says he's looking for work. What can you do? Well, he didn't want to just say a laborer because everybody said a laborer, common laborer. So he said, I'm a cook. This is a man who, didn't, who hadn't boiled water <laughs> at growing up, okay? But somehow those words came out of his mouth. And what happens? The people said, oh, the amazing. God has sent you the cook that we had for our daughter's wedding. He couldn't make it, and we needed a cook to cook for my da- for our daughter's wedding. And thank God you're here, and we need you to cook. Uh, we know exactly what we want you to cook. We want you to cook bacon and red cabbage. So here you go, a man who had never cooked anything in his life, who grew up in an Orthodox Jewish household, not only has to cook, has to cook bacon. He's probably never tasted bacon. I he had no idea. He had no idea. He had never tasted bacon. Never had no idea. Had, there's no way he would even know if it was good. But at this time, my mother was already at the Takiftas, who were not Jewish. And, and uh, Cheska Takifta, who was a wonderful cook, and took and actually, this is another point I have to say, just throw this in right now. My, uh, fed my mother like part of the family, gave my mother food like she was part of the family. There was no less for her and everything else. My mother fed, my f- mother ate well at that household. So my father went back to the Takiftas, and with the use of his uh, photographic memory, was able to remember everything that was needed to make the uh, bacon and red cabbage and when he made this he made the meal 
the people, the, the, the guy in a drunken stupor hugged my father and said it was the best meal I've ever tasted. It was the- <laughs> <laughs> now, is bacon and red cabbage a traditional Dutch food? I think it is, yeah. I believe so. It was, uh, yeah. That's, so that wasn't a, it was not an uncommon thing for somebody. That's, that's also why uh, he was able to get the recipe so easily. So it wasn't like some type of uh, strange dish. It was strange dish if you were Orthodox Jewish, but it wasn't a strange dish for the regular Dutch person. You are listening to Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon and Paul Solomon. Our guest is David Groen, who's a, a personal friend of ours as well as an incredible human being with an incredible family story. He is the author of a newly published book, uh, Jew Face, and it's the story of his parents' survival during the Dutch occupation of Holland. Now, uh, oh, by the way, uh, WCWP 88.1 FM, Brookville, New York. Um, I'm not sure if this is a story that I know from the book or from your parents, but I remember there was an incident in the hospital where the Nazis came in, your father like hid your mother in like the ceiling somehow, left the windows open, and when they came in, he said, she jumped out the window or some, something like that, and you know, at tremendous risk to himself, and incredible, you know, courage um, and cojones. <laughs> that actually wasn't my mother. No, who was that? That was the the, the um, directress of the hospital. Uh, that hospital was that. That hospital was the Yosa Invalida, which is the Jewish Invalid Hospital. My, um, it was a childhood friend of my father's who was running the show, and he knew that she was going to be treated as poorly as anybody else. My mother was already out of the place. Okay. Uh, I and he basically instructed what he did was he opened up the windows he went there was a room above the above the roof punched the wall out got her to stay in there closed it up and told her basically set up a, a code so that she would only answer to him if no matter what happened she would never not come out of there until, unless um, he would contact her he opened up the windows so when the Nazis came in and they saw the windows open and they saw nobody there they figured she jumped out and they never pursued her. And this woman survived the war and and basically spoke of the story years later as well. So it was, yeah. yeah. So I, I remember that from your father and mother when they told us that story. Now, what I find fascinating is here you'd think somebody going through such an ordeal would in essence lose faith because they're being persecuted for being Jewish, yet in later in life, uh, your father becomes a rabbi. Can you tell us a little bit about his spiritual awakening? Well, actually, interestingly enough, it, he this is the, how he grew up. And what my father, my father used to say, hakol talui b'mazal, which, which Hebrew means basically everything depends on luck. But mazal really means more like fortune, good fortune. And, and it basically relates to how the, the concept of God giving you good fortune. Now, my father, who passed away five years ago, rest in peace, he really recognized, he really, he always commented, he always remembered the six million. He would always remember the loss of the Dutch Jews and the loss of the six million in a way as though he wasn't even a victim. He never spoke of himself as a victim. And he felt very fortunate to be part of it. I think he felt in many ways a responsibility not just to his family that he left behind, but to the Jewish people that, that, that were lost to leave behind. And because he didn't, he never he, he it, it didn't the suffering, everybody suffered who went through that, but the, the things that he went through allowed him to come out sane and healthy. And he utilized that. He felt fortune for that. And I think that powered him on to, to continue his faith. And my mother, on the other hand, um, a lot of it was learned. She says it to this day. A lot of it was learned from, from my father. But to, the, to this day is, is a very believing woman and very practicing in the, in the religion and very, very proud and happy of it. And I think it's a very fortunate thing. While a lot of people rightly so, fell by the wayside and, and couldn't, couldn't keep it anymore, didn't want anything to do with it, which is understandable. My mother and my father, were they, they, they were able to continue it through and pass it on, on a very positive note to us. 
there's there's an aspect of the book that I want to address before I forget because it's something very important. Okay, um, that the the story is a concept of good against evil. I have had some people say to me, they ask me questions about my mother and my father. I speak of them and, and other people in the book like they never did anything wrong. Well, the reality is, every but nobody's perfect. But this book is not designed at all, and I did this on purpose. Is not is not made to expose any flaws of the average person. There's good against evil. If you were not a Nazi or a Nazi collaborator, I don't care how many times you argued with somebody else or how difficult you were or how cranky you could get or how nasty maybe you, whatever it is you ever did in your life, you were good. And if you were a Nazi or a Nazi collaborator, you were bad. And this book is very specific, specific about that. I make a very strong point of showing that if you were on the good side, you were good. If you were on the bad side, you were bad. Nothing else is addressed. And that's a very important, very important aspect. Well, here's the thing. It's all a matter of relativity. You know, today we're kind of soft. We live in, you know, people may complain about the economy and all these other things. But the truth is we can go outside. We can go on the train. Uh, when we took the Long Island Railroad, there was no one inspecting your internal papers. Right. No one was looking at your face to see whether you were a Jew. Right. You weren't worried about getting rounded up. Um, I, I guess I'm basically a journalist. I don't have to worry about military censors storming here and that if I don't give pro, you know, so-and-so propaganda that I'm going to be hauled off to a re-education facility. Right. You know, people, people take advantage, take, 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 take for, for granted, granted you know, <laughs> the fact that we can go vote without, you know, military people looking over your shoulders and telling you how to vote. Um, or that the government's going to be overthrown tomorrow, or that there's... Or something Rabbi Groen said to me, which I'll never forget. His citizenship was taken away and never restored. He was no longer a Dutch citizen when the da Nazis came. Well, when, when the Nazis came, basically anybody who was Jewish was a Jew. Right. I mean, right. That just, it, didn't, it didn't matter, and it didn't really matter to them that what, if, you were, if they were Jew, but he... On the other hand, he then got the papers of a of, of false of false papers of Dutchman. He had two different ones that he primarily used. Um, one was the name Cornelius Huchius. Good luck. I'm not even going to try <laughs> ask you guys to try to pronounce that. And the other one was Jan Henrat. Both these were the, the, the two. Did, and my mother had my mother had the name Tini. These were all phony false names that they were they, that they would use. But in my mother's case, it didn't really matter. Because she could have used a different name all she wanted. She still looked, they still knew she was Jewish. Yeah, did, did your mother ever do anything like wear a cross or anything like that just to... No, no, to not, a, not, a, no not at all. Uh, there was no way of ever of her hiding. In, when she was in Lema Lefeld, which is the town of the, where the Takiftas were, I really want to actually, this is an important point to mention, she, the Libertas Takifta and Cheska Takifta, they were the, the, the couple that, that hid my mother for almost a year and a half. Libertas Takifta was a builder, and he built a room, built a room in his workplace underground for my mother to live in for, for that period of time. And he did it specifically for a few reasons. He gave it, first of all, so she would have some privacy and be able to live with some dignity for that time, and also because of the fact that it, it, put, it, it hit her away to a point where if there was any type of raid overnight, she wouldn't be found. And the room, I, I write. There's a. I write a whole thing about the room in the book. The room is a very special, very special part of the story. My, it, it affected my mother. Still, she still has effects from living in those under she those claustrophobic? conditions. Claustrophobic. She's claustrophobic. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Right. She also developed um, some. She had she had pleurisy after the war because of the water that was built up on the bottom. So the conditions of the room were were very frightening, very scary. And and not wonderful, but the purpose of the room and the and the and the and what was the intention of the room showed the greatness of the Takiftas and Lema Felt. In, in many ways, they say that solitary confinement is like one of the greatest psychological tortures. Did she feel tortured by being in solitude and not and being cut off from the world? And at this time, at the same time, knowing in that solitude was really going on was the heinous murder of millions of people. The, my father came to visit her as often as possible. That made a difference. But what the, really was the worst part about it was there were times they would put, they would cover the, uh, Bertus Akifta would cover the 
had to cover the area where she was sleeping and set it up as though there was nothing there. So there were sandbags or, or, or cement bags, and basically the only way she could get in and out was him for him to come and get her. So if the Germans would, for whatever reason, or anything would happen to the Kiftas, or there was a bombing or anything, and he couldn't go get her out of there, she was stuck there. So in some ways, it was she felt at times... I mean, it, the, 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 you can't even imagine, you knowing that you could, you may never get out of there. So that was a very frightening a- aspect of the story for my mother. The Takif does must have had tremendous personal courage because I assume the penalty for hiding Jewish people during the war would have been brutal. They would have been treated like they were Jews, basically. I mean, and, and, and it's for anybody, everybody who doesn't know, I mean, if you, if you don't know, how the Jews were treated by the Nazis, you, you need to learn it. Anybody who doesn't know that needs to learn it. But basically, in the end, it ends with death. What happens until that point is, not is unspeakable. And for the Takiftas, that would have been the result. Yeah. For example, in Greece, what the Nazis were famous for doing was they would gather the men up to do forced calisthenics. And you would think, oh, how bad can that be? Well, it was done for hours upon hours, and when you were at the point of exhaustion, you were whipped to death. Yeah. That's just one Nazi tactic of control. Yeah, there was, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it's unspeakable. It's things that people should know about. Um, one of the things that I, I the re- importance of my, the, the website, hollandsheroes.com, I, this has become not just about the book, it's become a bit of a project to make sure people never forget and know then for me to fight against Holocaust denial because Holocaust denial is a dangerous, very dangerous form of anti-Semitism and it doesn't just hurt the Jews. For anybody who's listening to this, if you're not Jewish, understand that any time you let people forget or let people deny that they committed atrocities, you're opening the door for more atrocities, be it against the Jews or anybody else. Well, the thing is this, it's, it's like they say, like, well, it's only the Jews, but when the Jews are all killed off, they, you know, there's the next group of people with the quote they go after. Remember, in World War II, the Russians lost 20 million people. Right. You know, out of the 20 million, some were Jews, but there were plenty of non-Jewish people who perished in that war too. In fact, the Russians had a tremendous personal uh, loss of right. human life. I mean, think about 20 million people in a matter of years. It's absolutely, unspeakable. absolutely it's unspeakable. We, you know, we lost just as a side note, um, our fathers father's brother, our great uncle, Bachor Solomon, and his wife, they were killed in Auschwitz. They were, uh, they were owners of a taverna in uh, Yanina, Greece, and they were part, in March of 43, I think it was, or 44. There was the roundup of the Greek Jews, and they were shipped and to Auschwitz. And we have a photograph of that roundup, and if you ever want to feel something chilling, just look at a photograph of people who are potentially your relatives being rounded off to their death. And you can catch that at kkjsm.org. KKJSM.org. That's the Greek Jewish Synagogue Museum of New York. Uh, we only have uh, two minutes left. Wow, that was fast. And we barely scratched the surface, which means that for the people up there listening, you got to get a copy. you got to go to uh, hollandsheroes.com and uh, read all the information. What's on the website? Uh, the website, it, like I said, it covers a lot about um, anytime there's an addressing situation with, with uh, anti-Semitism, uh, with basically with any type of uh, of horrors in general, it's important to know. But the website also it basically tries to relate modern things to to the story in some ways. I try to get people on it. I try to get stories about the people that are happening today. I try to cover the names of the people. Um, I, I any any story that is going to 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 relate to the book in any way or fashion. And I like I definitely want participation from people out there as well. I want to know that people are are paying attention to the story. Well, I appreciate your time. We're, we're out of time. It's amazing. It's the fastest hour of radio ever. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, get the book, com is the website. The book is called Jew Face. It's authored by David Groen, G-R-O-E-N. And uh, he has a, a phenomenal family. And uh, it's dedicated, of course, uh, to his family. And let me just see I'm getting. And it's Author House is the publisher. Um, this is Richard Solomon, Paul Solomon, WCWP.org. Thank you for listening, as always. We appreciate um, you being letting us be part of your family, uh, your uh, radio family, we're in your cars, we're in your homes, we're in your computers, we're kind of everywhere. So it's really nice that you share uh, an hour with us each week, and we don't take that for granted. So thank you out there. Uh, and important. thank you for all the emails. And the emails, the phone calls, we, we get all kinds of... And thank you guys uh, for having me here tonight. Uh, appreciate it. So we're going to just dedicate this show to all the people out there who have had family members 
who've been murdered in some kind of atrocity, which over the millennium have been many. Thanks for listening. Stay, stay safe. We'll see you in a week.